Good morning. My name is Suzanne Maloney, and I'm Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the program and our Center for Middle East Policy, as well as the Israel Institute, which is our co-host for this morning, to today's event, Syrian Requiem, the Civil War and its Aftermath. This morning, we are pleased to be able to launch a new book, Syrian Requiem, which draws on more than 200 interviews to tell the story of the conflict in Syria. In detailing the long developing tensions in Syrian politics, cataloging the many actors who have fought in the war and discussing the ongoing policy priorities of the major powers involved, this new book provides an important contribution to our understanding of the humanitarian catastrophe that has unfolded in Syria. It's a timely book as well, as we near the 10th anniversary of the beginning of the conflict. I am delighted to welcome our excellent panel today, including the book's two co-authors to discuss the issues raised within their work. Ambassador Itamar Rabinovich, co-author of Syrian Requiem and a distinguished non-resident fellow with the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, is also the vice chair of the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. Previously, he was Israel's ambassador in Washington, D.C., chief negotiator with Syria, and president of Tel Aviv University. Carmid Valenci is also co-author of Syrian Requiem. She is a research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, where she is also the manager of the Syria Research Program and the editor of Strategic Assessment. Joining our two co-authors as a panelist is Morhaf Djojati, Morhaf is chair, class of 1955, and distinguished visiting professor of the Middle East and Global Studies at the Naval Academy at Annapolis. And finally, moderating our panel today is Stephen Heidemann, a non-resident senior fellow with the Center for Middle East Policy here at Brookings and the Janet Wright Ketchum 1953 chair of Middle East Studies at Smith College. With that, I'll turn the mic over to Steve and look forward to a fascinating and important discussion. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for those introductions. And my thanks as well to the Brookings Institution uh, and the Israel Institute for organizing and hosting this event. And my very sincere thanks to uh, Ambassador Rebinovich and Dr. Valenci for having given us this absolutely fascinating account of the conflict that has gripped Syria, the region, and many other parts of the world for the past decade especially delighted to have my old friend, Dr. Murhaf Jouajati with us as well. I wanted to start out uh, this morning, since we're here to talk about this very interesting book that will be released, I think this month in the United States by Princeton University Press, uh, to, to ask uh, um, uh, Itamar Rabinovich and Karmit Valenci to each take a couple of minutes to get us launched by telling us what you see as the most important takeaways from the book. What is it that you think people who, who um, are interested in the Syria conflict would learn uh, in particular from the account that you've put in so much work to assemble over the past uh, couple of years? Please, Dr. Rabinovich. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, two points. The first I think has to do with the fundamental weakness of uh, the states that form the core area of, of the Middle East, specifically Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, um, all unstable, all in, unfortunately um, meeting the description of failed, failed states. Uh, this has to do with the artificial way in which their borders were created by the colonial powers, the famous Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 and the peace settlement after World War I, and the discrepancy between the uh, pluralistic nature of the society and the nature of the political system. It's, it's been the case with all, uh, with all three, and, uh, and, and until addressed uh, seriously, uh, there will be no stability in, uh, in the core area of, of the Middle East, which leaves sort of a black hole in the middle of, of the region, uh, a source of instability uh, invites regional and international meddling and, and competition. The second has to do with U.S. policy, the flaws of U.S. policy, both under President uh, Obama and President uh, Trump, in different different flaws, but the, the U.S. has played uh, 
uh, a partial limited sometimes negative role in in the crisis has been a, heat, a subject of a heated policy debate and I would say legacy debate will be in the in the United States and confronting the Biden administration as it is putting together a Middle East policy now. Thank you very much, Carmine. Good morning and uh, shalom. It's great to be here with you, even if only virtually. I'm delighted that we can have this conversation. So thank you for this uh, great opportunity. Um, I would say that uh, one of the most uh, significant thing I think that we can take from the book is that as the title of the book implies, the Syrian crisis endures. Uh, from our perspective, Syria is unlikely to be put together again anytime soon and remains a divided and unstable theater, I would say. Um, it is true that President Bashar al-Assad remains in power, but is a more of a survivor rather than a winner. He's entirely dependent on Russia and Iran and faces multiple uh, challenges, uh, competing with uh, um, multiple actors who operate in Syria. Uh, he only controls 60% out of uh, Syrian territories, and even there, he's uh, not able to uh, fully govern and uh, uh, he does not have the adequate resources to uh, uh, govern these uh, territories. I would say that's one of my uh, personal conclusion from the book is that I don't think that there is a future to Syria, to Syria under Bashar. And uh, a change regime, I would say, is a fantasy. Um, Bashar as of 2021 is a dictator on steroids. Of course, more paranoid than he uh, used to be. And the Assad continues in his oppression and violence, including um, arrests, disappearances, and persecutions of individuals suspected of disloyalty. Um, instead of reconstruction, Syria re he re rehabilitates his army and strengthens its um, internal security apparatuses in order to generate fear and deter the public from further social unrest. So learning Bashar characteristics and history, this is my uh, take on this one, and finally, I would say that the international community um, should have done and should do more to resolve this conflict. Um, sitting on the sideline and watch the grim situation of the Syrian state and its people is just not enough and does not make any sense. Um, I believe that the world cannot wash its hands of Syria. It must deal with it and uh, secure a better future to this poor state and, of course, this, uh, the poor uh, Syrians. Interesting. Both of you. Thank you. So... We have a regime that is aggressively working to reassert itself along uh, deeply authoritarian lines. We have drivers of conflict that have not been resolved and in fact have been exacerbated uh, in the period since the uprising began in 2011. And we have external actors whose policy responses to these very challenging conditions inside of Syria are uncertain, uh, ambiguous and ambivalent. That's, that's a very interesting combination of circumstances to have to confront. And I'd, I'd like to turn in particular to the role of one uh, key external actor, uh, the United States. Um, you spend some significant time in, uh, in the book um, reviewing the, the history of US engagement in Syria during the period of, of the conflict. And you note with, I think, uh, a great deal of candor that the voices within the Obama administration arguing against significant engagement in the conflict were those that, that basically won the U.S. debate about <laughs> what the U.S. should do uh, in response to the escalations of violence and massive humanitarian issues that the Syrian <laughs> conflict posed. And so I'd... I'd, I'd Appreciate hearing. I think it would be interesting for our audience to hear. And and Murhoff, I'd like you to jump in on this as as well. Um, what you think the U.S. might have done differently at some point in the conflict that might have led to a different result, or that might have had some effect on the the trajectory of of the conflict. And why don't we go in the same order that we did before, Itamar? If you'd like to jump in, and then Karmit, yeah. and then Murhoff. Okay. Um, of course, most, the most famous incident uh, during the, the Obama period was the red line uh, issue in 2013, when a red line marked by the president was crossed by Bashar al-Assad. Uh, 
and ultimately decided not to retaliate and uh, in, a, in a way paved the way for the Russian, uh, Russian intervention because the Russians felt that they practically had a free hand in, uh, in Syria. Um, but uh, the turning point to me is 2012 when there was a, a plan put together by director of Central Intelligence uh, Petraeus and with the participation of several regional and international uh, partners to uh, equip and train the Free Syrian Army, the main military force of the opposition at the time to give it a fighting chance against the regular Syrian army. And it was supported by Secretary of State Clinton and not supported by uh, President Obama. I, I should mention that uh, a very significant interview granted by President Obama to the to Je Jeffrey Goldberg in the Atlantic uh, towards the end of his uh, term uh, was largely devoted to the Syrian issue because I think the president was correct in feeling that when his legacy is discussed and debated in, in years to come, uh, the Syria policy would be a, a major issue. Um, when uh, President uh, Trump came in, he was totally uninterested in Syria, wanting to, to pull the troops out. He had a peculiar relationship with Turkey and President Erdogan. Um, one would not have imagined the US president telling the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Turkey or the President of Turkey, if you want Syria, you can have it. We are going out, very peculiar way. And a very interesting point is the, uh, in a way, the deep state uh, role of the bureaucracy, not deep state in the QAnon sense, but in the sense that the bureaucracy actually manipulates the president because uh, as I think uh, Ambassador Jeffrey was very open in, in admitting recently, uh, they did not agree with the president's policy and manipulated it, persuade, persuading him uh, in different ways to keep a small number of U.S. troops, uh, which gives the U.S. actually a lot of leverage in, in Syria. They, with a small military presence and a partnership with the Kurdish militia, they control more than 20% of uh, Syrian territory, the oil fields, and have a say at the, uh, at the table. So, uh, what uh, to tie to the current discussion of uh, the Biden policy with regard to, uh, to Syria, uh, I would hope that uh, as part of a larger Middle East policy in the context of uh, crafting a different relationship with both Iran and, and Turkey, uh, the administration will find a way to formulate a more effective Syria policy. Thank you. This, this question about leverage is one that we should probably come back to. And Kermit, before you jump in, I'd just like to point out to all of our viewers that uh, if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat function to do that. Uh, we will be uh, taking questions, I hope, uh, toward the end of the moderated uh, component of our conversation this morning. So please feel free to, to ask questions if you have any. Kermit, please proceed. So I think that the U.S. policy had a significant impact on the course of events uh, in Syria. And from the very beginning of this crisis, the U.S. faces a dilemma, uh, which the United States did not want to intervene militarily in the conflict, but could also not accept the human tragedy uh, there. Um, U.S., of course, played a leading role in building the international coalition against uh, ISIS, but it objected to any direct participation in the conflict or to a direct fighting uh, against uh, Assad. And as Itamar mentioned, the crucial American decisions with regard to the Syrian rebellion were made by President Obama in 2012 and 2013, when he overruled the plan to arm and train the, the, the opposition, uh, mm -hmm. most, most prominently the Free Syrian Army, and when he decided to ignore his own red line and to refrain from uh, basically penalizing Assad for a massive uh, use of chemical weapons against his own uh, people. Um, Obama found a way to resolve this issue by dismantling the regime chemical weapons arsenal. And this was uh, to be one of the most important uh, turning points of the Syrian crisis, I would say. Um, and it also, Obama's de decision also uh, paved the way for uh, Russian military intervention and inflicted a deadly blow uh, 
on the more pragmatic element of the Syrian opposition, and we all know how this, uh, this uh, development ended. Uh, so I think that the United States, um, again, refrained from refraining from any military action that could be uh, seen against Assad regime is a very uh, important uh, uh, point in this regard. Um, surprisingly, I think that this uh, policy adopted by uh, Obama's successor, by President Trump, uh, though it is worth mentioning that Trump's administration uh, twice responded militarily to the regime chemical attacks on civilians, and by that he um, disapproved the Obama thesis that punishing and deterring Assad would only uh, lead to invasion and uh, occupation. Uh, regarding Biden, I think the new administration still uh, seems to be debating the right way to approach the Syrian issue. Um, recent statements by advisors of uh, Biden indicate the intention to keep the American troops, there are about 2,000 two, uh, troops in Syrian, mm -hmm. Syrian soil, and also to increase the pressure on Assad in order to uh, lead to a change in his policy, but this is uh, yet to be uh, studied, uh, I think that one of the first things that the Biden administration will need to, uh, to do is to boost the diplomatic process around uh, Syria issue and to act far more assertively and decisively on goals set on in, uh, out in UN Resolution 2254 of December 2015, which basically draft uh, the roadmap for peace process in Syria. And I also think that the new administration must commit itself to punishing militarily any renewed campaign of mass killing of civilian and state terror undertaking by uh, the Assad regime. Um, of course, the humanitarian issue is, is mostly important and the US should allow humanitarian assistance to refugees and to Syrian uh, living under uh, areas not controlled uh, by the regime. Um, in any case, I would say that the United States cannot afford, afford to just abandon Syria, you know, and trust Moscow and Tehran to handle it. Uh, well, I, 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 hope, I hope the Biden administration team is listening. Um, <laughs> Morhof, what's your, what's your sense of, of what might have been done differently that could perhaps have shaped the trajectory in, in somewhat different directions, perhaps more positive directions from an American perspective? Uh, thank you, Stephen. And I too would like to uh, thank the uh, Brookings Institution for including me in this important uh, panel. Uh, first of all, never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I would be um, uh, so much in agreement with Israeli statements on Syria. Uh, but I do want to second uh, both uh, uh, speakers on all these points. Uh, with regard to the United States, uh, certainly, the Petraeus initiative to uh, train and arm the Free Syrian Army was a very good one, I think. Uh, I would like to uh, remind people uh, that the Free Syrian Army uh, and the opposition movement in general never asked and never wanted American boots on the ground. And it was sufficient for them uh, to be supplied with weapons in order to counteract the uh, brutality of the regime. Uh, but again, uh, President Obama at the time uh, uh, rejected uh, this initiative. Uh, the death blow uh, came uh, when the red line of uh, President Obama was crossed. Uh, and uh, uh, here, really, it had sent no uncertain message to Moscow that it could have a free hand in Syria. Had, I think, the Russian government had it understood that uh, the United States was serious about Syria, uh, there would not have been the intervention of the Russians in order to prop up the Assad regime. Um, throughout the Obama administration, uh, it was reluctance. It was a lack of leadership. And I could say the same about the uh, Trump administration. Both were reluctant. Uh, Trump, in fact, was not interested in Syria. Uh, both lacked leadership on this question. And what the book here, I think, um, does very well is to show that the lack of U.S. leadership and the reluctance of the, U uh, of the United States to uh, intervene more forcefully in this uh, Syria crisis led other countries in Europe to do the same, and that led also 
the Arab League to do the same. And so uh, it is uh, the, the really the, the crisis and the outcome of the crisis was dependent on the United States first and foremost, and on the political will or lack thereof in the United States first and foremost. We now come to the Biden administration. Um, President Biden has a lot on his plate. There is a national emergency, which is the first and foremost priority for this administration. And there are very many important international questions that are going to uh, occupy his time and the time of his administration. I think that Syria is going to be on the back burner again. And I fear this very much. Uh, I fear uh, very much uh, uh, this uh, renewed talk of the United States uh, and in its in interests in dealing with Iran and with the nuclear issue. And my fear uh, is that uh, any deal that may potentially come about is going to be at the expense of the Syrian people again. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, within this administration, there are forces uh, that uh, uh, would push the president uh, towards uh, the deal with Iran at the expense of the Syrians. And I am hoping for other forces who view things differently. And those, uh, especially those officials who now look back on history and regretted, regretted not having been more engaged on the Syrian crisis than they had been. All in all, I believe the United States at the very first could have ended the Syrian crisis in a positive manner in a very short amount of time and with a lot less loss of people. May I remind people that until now, 10 years later, there are more than 1 million people who have been murdered by the Assad regime and that there are 11 million refugees, 6 million of them uh, outside of Syria and that 70% of Syria's infrastructure has been totally destroyed. All this could have been prevented had the United States uh, uh, had more of a political will uh, to intervene. Thank you all for those comments very much. You all highlight in different ways, I think, and this is a point that's also referenced very directly in the book, that while the Obama administration and to some extent the Trump administration were preoccupied with the costs of engagement, with what the consequences might be, and sometimes, Carmita, as you hinted, or tended to overestimate or exaggerate what the potential downsides of a more assertive engagement on Syria might be, far less thought was given to the consequences of not acting, of, of not engaging more directly. And I think all of you pointed to important different consequences flowing from, from not giving adequate attention to the potential costs of, of disengagement. But one of the, the big uh, questions that is part of the broader Syria debate in Washington today concerns precisely this issue, Itamar, that you raised, which is leverage and US leverage. And we've just had, for example, uh, a recent uh, op-ed piece written by the former US ambassador to Syria and then ambassador to the Syrian people, Robert Ford, in which he argued that the US does not have leverage, that the US needs to acknowledge that it is no longer capable of influencing the trajectory of the Syrian conflict. And that the U Biden administration should make uh, the tough decision, the tough call uh, to distance itself from the Syrian conflict, focus on issues of greater priority and leave the uh, leave the, the pathway out of conflict in, in Syria, resolving remaining issues in the Northwest and Northeast and the residual presence of ISIS to the Russians, the Turks, the Iranians, and even uh, to a regime that the US continues to regard as, as illegitimate for its conduct during the conflict. So if, if there is a sense that the US should have done more in the past, if there is a hope, Karmit, as you expressed, that the new team will find its way toward a more engaged approach to Syria, if Itamar, as you suggested, the US continues to have leverage, and I tend to share that sense. I do think that the very small presence the US has in the Northeast, um, it gives uh, the, the United States far more influence than is often acknowledged uh, 
what what are the possibilities for deploying that leverage? What is it you think the U.S. can do that would demonstrate to those who are now arguing against engagement that there remains a useful role for the U.S.? What do you think some of the possibilities are for the U.S. to play a constructive role in bringing the conflict to a close um, on the basis of a political settlement that would more closely reflect the interests and concerns and needs of Syrians as opposed to those of the regime and its foreign patrons? Uh, let me begin, actually, Morhaf, with you this time. Um. Look, there is a great window, well, great is probably too strong of a word, but there is a window of opportunity here. Given the increasing weakness, you might be surprised, of the Assad uh, regime. Now, most people will talk about Assad's victory on this and that. I don't see it this way. Uh, Assad is very much in trouble. Uh, yes, he has the upper hand militarily, thanks to uh, the Russian and Iranian uh, assistance. Um, but he controls 60% of the territory. That is not victory to me. He controls about 60% of the population. That is not victory to me. Uh, he has now a huge problem uh, with the lack of trust by even his very supporters in how uh, this pandemic is being handled. Um, there, is, uh, there are long lines uh, for days to get fuel. Uh, for heating in this cold winter. Uh, people are struggling to buy bread. Uh, and so uh, it is an economy that is collapsing. Uh, to further aggravate this, there is the collapse of the Lebanese economy on which Syrian businessmen uh, depended. Uh, so there is a window of opportunity here to exert pressure uh, on Assad. How do we exert pressure on Assad? Not necessarily militarily, uh, but by uh, cooperating with the Russians, uh, who also, despite their assistance, their military assistance to Assad, are having serious problems with him. And they have uh, voiced that publicly from time to time. So I think at the end of the day, the United States and Russia should find ways to cooperate uh, into uh, bringing this crisis to a uh, close. You know, uh, Morhav, as much as I'd, I'd like to think that, that the relationship with Russia offers us one, one instrument of leverage, we have tried for years and years to outsource leverage over the Assad regime to the Russians, uh, and it has produced, I'm afraid, very little uh, in the end. But let's, let's, hold, on, let's hold on that and, and raise the significant questions about uh, whether the issues that the Russians have with the Assad regime outweigh uh, the sense of Russia's leadership, including uh, President Putin, that the relationship is more important than the, the issues um, that, it, that it raises for them. Uh, Karmit, what's your, what's your sense about where we might be able to play a more productive role, where the US might be able to play a more productive role in the conflict? given where we are right now? Well, first of all, I would say again, uh, the current the regime is in a very uh, weak point right now. Not only the regime, but also uh, one of its uh, bigger uh, biggest supporter, Iran, and the Iranian uh, Shiite uh, axis uh, uh, is a very in a, in a weakened point. And I think that the international community should take advantage of this weakness. And as Moa said, this is a, a window of opportunity that uh, we need to think how to uh, uh, better exploit it. Um, I think that the American troops on the ground, even if only symbolic uh, uh, presence on the ground, is highly important as a deterrent to Iran and to, uh, um, you know, to uh, harm its uh, vision to uh, uh, consolidate the Iranian uh, uh, land bridge from uh, Iraq to Syria and also to defend the Kurds, which uh, are the main actors who actually fought ISIS on the ground, I think it's one of the commitments that uh, the US should keep and, and be there and protect them. And so I think that uh, it's very important to keep American troops on a Syrian group uh, ground. Um, and I hope that the next regime will uh, uh, continue in this policy. And again, I think that the main point uh, is, has to do with the diplomatic process. I think that uh, the U.S. should lead uh, 
And I do believe that uh, tighter cooperation with Russia is uh, possible, at least in, in the uh, Syrian case, and contrary to other uh, international issues, I think that they could cooperate, but it's not only between uh, the US and Russia. I think that a lot of, there are a lot of regional actors, the Gulf states, for instance, that are very relevant. Uh, Turkey will have to be part of this uh, um, diplomatic initiative. And, you know, with the normalization winds uh, blowing in the region, uh, I think that we can all, uh, even if, even Israel, can find a common ground uh, with all these uh, actors and to uh, support and encourage this kind of uh, diplomatic uh, initiative that basically uh, call to the, the removal of Assad. This is the only option to stabilize uh, the Syrian state. Well, it seems that that the changing tides in the region um, with respect to Israeli-Arab relations have gone hand in hand with modest, but but nonetheless um, non-trivial uh, moves on the part of some of those governments with whom Israel now has new ties to also um, begin to rebuild relations with the Assad regime. So the, <clears throat> those policy uh, trends may actually pull in somewhat different directions, it seems. I, it's not entirely clear, of course, but it isn't clear yet that they align in the way that you suggested. It's something we're thinking about. Itamar, what's, what's your sense about where the leverage might be and how the U.S. might might deploy it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have a high, very high regard for Ambassador Ford. I think that he was personally courageous when he went to Hama in the middle of the insurrection. I think he handled himself very well in opposing the administration of behaving very professionally as a U.S. Uh, diplomat, but I disagree with his uh, recommendation. I don't think the United States can afford to be absent from a major Middle Eastern arena. I mean, the, the U.S. is a superpower. Uh, it needs to be in all crucial uh, international arenas. The Middle East is one of them. And if you want to, to be present in the Middle East, to have influence in the Middle East, you cannot just walk away from, from Syria. It's too, too central and too, too important. Now, how can influence be exerted? Two, two points. One is to continue what actually has been the policy of the bureaucracy as represented by Ambassador Jeffrey at, at the time, not necessarily by President Trump. That is to say, um, to, to try to bring the regime to its knees by refusing any funding for reconstruction as long as there is no uh, political settlement, reform and return of refugees. And in the absence of American, European or in, uh, international institutions financial help, the money for reconstruction is not going to arrive and the regime is bound to continue to live on a, a shoestring. And this is not short term policy, this is long term uh, policy, but I think it's a very sound policy. You don't need to send troops into, or more troops into Syria in order to have influence. The second has to do uh, with the need sometimes to support Israel vis-a-vis -vis Russia when it comes to fighting the Iranian drive to build the second Lebanon in Syria, to build a military infrastructure, the precise missiles and, uh, and so forth. Uh, Russia, 90 odd percent of the time, uh, is, is not interfering with Israeli action. At one point, it lost patience with Israel and interfered with Israeli action. It's not up to Israel to stand up to Russia. We are, after all, a small Middle Eastern country. It's up to the United States to do that when it's needed. Uh, it was not there in the times of Trump, but I think President Biden and his administration need to, to take that into account at any, any given moment they might be required to, to give Israel backing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a potential change in Russian policy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, you've both, um, you've both presented uh, a picture of the Assad regime as, as struggling as a subject to a number of, of internal challenges and, and, of course, significant external challenges as well. And I, I wanted to ask just a couple more questions before opening things up and would again remind our viewers that the chat function is available if you want to pose questions. We have some that, that have come in and would be welcome to receive more.
But but one question, um, Itamar and Carmine, for you, and then and then one for for Murhaf. You've you've both made the case, and I think quite persuasively, that that we need to be mindful of the many vulnerabilities of the Assad regime. Uh, to some extent, of the effectiveness with which um, U.S. policy and the policy of the European Union concerning reconstruction funding have contributed to the vulnerabilities and weaknesses that the Assad regime is wrestling with, and perhaps created possibilities for translating those vulnerabilities into some sort of movement toward an outcome based on 2254, the UN Security Council resolution uh, that defines what a political settlement might look like and how we might reach it. But it seems as if within the Israeli security establishment, um, there has been a kind of grudging acknowledgement that the Assad regime is not going anywhere. There is a sense that Israel has a long history with uh, the regime of both Hafiz al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad, and that he is, in effect, the devil uh, Israel knows, and that the most prudent course at the moment, even while Israel continues to uh, take active measures to try to prevent the deepening of Iran's presence along Israel's northern border, um, that the most prudent course is to is to accept reality, in effect, and to acknowledge that Assad will be there. It, is, is it uh, your sense, however, given all of the issues we've talked about that today, to, talked about this morning, that confront the Assad regime, the economic issues, the uh, escalation of violence, the ongoing low-level insurgency in the South, the continued unresolved problems in the Northwest and the Northeast. Is it, is it your sense that, that Assad can be a source of stability in, in, in Syria? Is it, is it your sense that uh, Israel is making the right call if it, um, if it arrives at this conclusion and acts on the conclusion that it has no alternative but Assad? What's your, what's your sense of that, Itamar, and then Karmit, and then Morhaf, I have a question for you about the opposition. First of all, Israel, like the United States, does not want a massive military intervention in, uh, in Syria. I've often been asked, Israel uh, is the strongest military power in that uh, area. Uh, it could have decided the issue if it, if it really wanted to intervene. Uh, it did not want to intervene. Israel lives still with the memory of the 1982 war in Lebanon, a major effort to try to engineer the politics of a neighboring Arab state that ended with, in failure and too many years of uh, extended stay in, uh, in Lebanon. And there's no appetite in Israel uh, to, do, to repeat that in, uh, in Syria. Uh, second, there's the question of uh, the alternative. I said, uh, when the, the phrase, the devil we know, was, was first uttered by uh, Prime Minister Sharon to President Bush at the, uh, uh, at the time, uh, he meant to say that if the alternative to Assad is Islamist, then we prefer Assad. Uh, in the meantime, we have also discovered to the right of the Islamists, uh, the jihadis. Uh, right now, the opposition, unfortunately, does not project uh, the image of, uh, of a viable uh, alternative. The opposition is, is divided. When I used to meet with uh, opposition activists, uh, leaders sometimes over the years, I always used to ask them, ask yourself, how come that no one in the world knows who the head of the Syrian opposition is? And who is the alternative to, to Bashar al-Assad? And the divisiveness of the opposition is a reflection, reflection of the divisiveness of the country. So right now that question does not present itself to, to Israel. Uh, and you know, no country in the world wants uh, anarchy on, on the other side of its, of its border. So right now, uh, Assad maintains a semblance of, uh, uh, of some order in, in Syria. He's not challenged seriously by uh, any opposition force. If such a force emerges, Israel will have to make a choice, but that, that uh, need uh, does not confront Israel right now. But it could, I suppose, uh, in, in the future, um, it, it could.
Karmit, what's your what's your take? Yeah, so um, by not interfering at the initial phases of the war, I think that Israel basically came to terms with the idea that Assad would remain in power and perhaps even it uh, serve its uh, interest. And that policy stems from uh, various reasons. First of all, as you said, Israel had the tendency to prefer the devil we know. Obviously, uh, the Assad regime kept the Syrian front uh, quiet for many years. And we just mentioned all the uh, multiple challenges that Assad is currently facing. He's most, mostly concerned with regaining his hold over Syria. He's not interested in a direct confrontation with Israel. Um, so having said that, I think that um, recently, I would say the past few years, uh, something has changed in Israel's uh, point of view or Israel's perception towards its policy in, in Syria. And I think we, a lot of us realize that um, Assad is either unwilling or unable to remove the Iranian presence from Syria. And this is, the, of, of course, Israel's main concern, the Iranian entrenchment in Syria, and not only in, in, near our border in the Golan Heights, and, uh, but also in the deep of Syria. And so I think that we realize that Assad is an integral part of the radical axis, and it will not uh, uh, allow uh, uh, or diminish or undermine his relations with Iran. So it was back in 2016 when Israel, I think that for the first time grasped the scope and the extent of the Iranian entrenchment and decided to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, use the aerial attack and to attack uh, in order to attack Iranian assets uh, in Syria, what we call in Hebrew the Mabam, the campaign between wars. Uh, it also involved in uh, more of a humanitarian project, the Operation uh, Good Neighbor, uh, which is Israel basically provided humanitarian aid and support to the Syrian uh, who lives in, uh, in the southern part of the state. Um, but I think Israel's main interest is uh, basically any scenario in, in Syria which results in maximum removal of, uh, of the Iranians, or at least diminishing uh, their influence and power, and I'm um, repeating myself, but this could be achieved uh, only if Bashar is being removed. I think that a lot of voices in Israel and a lot of officials in Israel started to acknowledge this uh, equation. And of course, there is a debate. Itamar presented a different point of view regarding the alternative, but we have a clear demonstration of uh, the way Syria looks right now under Bashar controls. And it's a Kermit, you've frozen. We seem to be having a bit of trouble with the with the connection. Kermit, we you lost you. Now? We lost you for we lost you for a moment there. Okay. Just one or two word uh, summary of of and sort of wrap up. Yeah. So I would say that um, I think that uh, we have a great demonstration, a uh, really clear demonstration of the way that Syria looks right now under Bashar al-Assad uh, control, and it's a completely chaos. Even if he managed to regain control over uh, southern Syria, uh, the, it's very chaotic. Multiple actors operate there, and I think that Russia is the main decision-making uh, uh, maker today in uh, Syria, not Bashar al-Assad. Yeah, so there are it, alternatives to Bashar. It, it's interesting. The, the devil we know argument um, was premised to some extent on the assumption that the Assad regimes would maintain the kind of stability Itamar that you mentioned existed from uh, the the end of, of the 73 war, more or less uh, uh, for several decades. Uh, and if that's no longer the case, then the extent to which just knowing who that devil is, uh, is, a, is a benefit, I think, becomes open to question. And things have changed on the Israeli side as well. The annexation of the Golan would seem to have a significant implication for the possibilities for, for any kind of future negotiation uh, between Israel and Syria directly. So, so it seems that, that, that uh, the restoration of that, of that sort of starting point of the devil we know uh, as the basis for Israeli policy may turn out to be perhaps somewhat problematic. Yeah. What off before we before we open up and and let me just also point out as I've been been notified that in addition to the chat, it's possible to ask questions using the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag Syrian Requiem, or by emailing events at brookings.edu. We already have quite a few questions, however, so I'll just warn everyone that we won't be able to get to them all in the time we have left. 
but Morhof, it, it isn't only um, the, uh, the the U.S. and others uh, who've struggled to figure out what to do as conditions on the ground in Syria have changed. The Syrian opposition has also, uh, I think, um, struggled uh, on its own with its declining relevance, declining influence, as the Syrian regime has retaken control of much of opposition-held territory, as international diplomacy has tended to, to uh, wane, as the Astana process became the arena within which so many critical uh, elements of, of management of the conflict were, were decided. Um, what, is, what is your sense of, of the future of, of the opposition? Of course, the Geneva process continues. It continues to participate. I, I don't know perhaps whether it should. Uh, the, the Geneva process has been described as, as a form of zombie diplomacy par excellence, uh, keeping going but with no discernible progress. What, what are the possibilities for the opposition now? Should it stay in Geneva? What should, what should it do? What, it, what is its role given the current circumstances? Before, before I get to what it should do or what it can do, um, let me agree with Ambassador Rabinovich. The, uh, the opposition uh, initially and today uh, was very divided. Uh, there was a lot of factionalism. Uh, there was political intrigue. Uh, and that took away from the credibility of the opposition vis-a-vis -vis the international community, no doubt. Um, but I have to remind you that the uprising in Syria initially was spontaneous and there was no organization at the time. Uh, there were no political leaders because all the traditional national political leaders have either been killed by the Assad regime or have been uh, uh, exiled or what have you. And so the mere fact that an opposition, a political opposition arose is an absolute miracle. Uh, there has been no political experience for the Syrians since 1963, when martial law was declared and any dissent was snuffed out. Uh, so again, it's a miracle that there was an, a political opposition. Uh, the political opposition tried to form a Syrian interim government. The interim government, uh, one of its members uh, was in charge of the Free Syrian Army. And things went well initially until some uh, regional parties uh, put their fingers in the pie and uh, had their own preferred factions to fund. And this is when things began to fall apart. No, it was not an alternative to the Assad regime in the eyes of the international community. Absolutely true. Uh, but in addition to this uh, regional playing around with the free Syrian army, then uh, there was another whammy, and that is the jihadists, the extremists, the terrorists. And so that fragmented Free Syrian Army was fighting both the Assad regime and the jihadists. Um, furthering and exacerbating the weakness of the uh, opposition. The opposition will not go away and has learned in these 10 years many lessons. And the role it is now playing, and it should continue uh, to play, is a political diplomatic uh, role to keep the, uh, the uh, to keep Assad's feet uh, on fire, and to remind the international community that Assad no is not the agent of stability in Syria; he is the agent of instability. And as a result of these diplomatic efforts, uh, you know I have to give credit to. Uh, Syrian NGOs, Syrian American NGOs who have pushed for the Caesars Act and the sanctions against uh, uh, persons in the elite of, of the Assad regime. Uh, there has been a lot of humanitarian uh, uh, work and uh, rescue uh, by Syrian NGOs in those areas that are not controlled by the regime. Uh, there has been a lot of efforts uh, in Europe to bring some of those uh, who have participated in the killing of uh, Syrians uh, to bring them to tribunals, such as in Germany and in Madrid. So the opposition will not go away. It has learned many lessons. It is not strong enough now to be able to 
act as a state, but it has to uh, render accountability to the Assad regime by constantly reminding the world of what Assad has done and what the future lies ahead if nothing is done against him. Uh, here, we might want to uh, ask the Italian narcotics and custom services of how many, uh, how much drugs are uh, being exported from Syria to Italy, or for that matter, to the Egyptian authorities or the Saudi authorities. Uh, if nothing is done, Syria will implode, and that is going to create a further mess in Syria and uh, with its ripple effects throughout the Middle East. So again, and here that dovetails nicely what we were talking about uh, earlier about the Biden administration, which has the choice of either uh, doing nothing and then uh, expecting a further mess, if that's at all possible in the Middle East, or now acting uh, in conjunction with this growing Syrian opposition uh, in order to fix things. Thank you, Morhaf. I if, if it uh, were the case that the U.S. and the EU were willing to engage with the opposition more actively to assist its transition to be able to perform these functions that you describe, I think that would be a very welcome development. It's, the, 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 the support has been rather lukewarm uh, in the past several years. Let me turn to some questions from the audience. It's, it's, we only have about eight minutes or so left. And one of the questions concerns sanctions and your views on the utility of sanctions, another really important piece of the policy debate, uh, both in the EUS and uh, in the US and in the EU. But before that, um, Itamar, I had one very specific question that came in for you concerning your comment about the importance of the US providing additional top uh, cover for Israeli actions against Iran in Russia. Uh, the sense in in Syria, sorry, the sense of the of the of the question um, was that that you felt that perhaps the U.S. had not done enough in that regard in the past, whereas the impression of our colleague asking the question is that the Trump administration gave a great deal of cover uh, to Israel in support of its operations against Iran in Syria. So, it it. it could you just elaborate a bit on where you felt perhaps that things might not have been as supportive as you would have liked? Yeah. Uh, yes, the uh, Trump administration did support the Israeli policy of trying to prevent the construction of uh, military infrastructure and uh, missile infrastructure by Iran in, uh, in Syria. Um, and Russia was willing to look the other way uh, reflecting both, a, I would say, a reasonable working relationship with, uh, between uh, uh, President Putin and Prime Minister Netanyahu, but also the complex attitude of Russia to Iran's role, because they are, not, they are partners, but they are also competitors in, in Syria. And I think sometimes they don't mind if Israel is uh, cutting them down to size. But uh, there was an, an incident where the Syrian air defense shot down a Russian, uh, a Russian plane. Uh, could and, someone uh, please mute? There's, there's a yeah. disturbance. Thank you. Um, um, and uh, at that time, for a few weeks, they interfered with Israeli overflights over Syria. And there was no support from the Trump administration at that time. Now, that could repeat itself. And what I meant is that if it ever happened in the future, uh, it would be wise for the United States to uh, support, uh, give Israel cover or support vis-a-vis -vis Russia, because uh, you know Russia and the United States play in one league and we play in another. Thank you, thank you for that. So let's wrap up with with a round of comments on on the utility of sanctions and the efficacy of of sanctions. Uh, another really critical piece of of the policy debate today. Um, the U.S. policy towards Syria now rests very heavily on, on sanctions. Uh, we've mentioned the Caesar Civilian Protection Act, which was passed into law now about a year ago. And that is only one of a wide, wide, wide web of sanctions that have been imposed on the Assad regime and on specific individuals, um, not only by the U.S., but by the EU, by Canada, by a number of, of, of other countries, uh, Australia, Japan, England. Uh, 
each have their own sanctions regimes in, in place. There is an argument that sanctions are one of the principal causes of human suffering in Syria. Uh, I, I tend to be somewhat skeptical of that view, given the effects of, of conflict, given corruption, given the predatory nature of the Assad regime. And yet the argument is out there. And we find ourselves confronting the question of whether and how we might ease the burden of sanctions on Syrians all the time. In fact, a former ambassador to Lebanon uh, and uh, deputy, uh, I think deputy secretary of the UN for political affairs, uh, Jeffrey Feltman argued recently with a colleague for a strategy in which sanctions would gradually be lifted in exchange for compromises or concessions toward a political settlement by the Assad regime. What is your sense of the efficacy of sanctions? What, what role do they play? How might we leverage sanctions? And I'm, I'm going to have to ask you all to be rather brief in your responses, if you don't mind. And let me begin this time with Karmit, and, and then we'll shift to Murhaf, and Ambassador Abinovich will give you the last word. Well, dealing with the authoritarian regimes, I think that economic sanction is a very limited and uh, less uh, efficient uh, tool because I am thinking about both about Iran and uh, Syria when, when I'm answering this uh, question. And as you said, I mean, the economic sanction on Bashar al-Assad did not and his uh, inner circle and his families and so on has not uh, basically changed his uh, behavior, changes his, uh, his policy towards anything. He continues to do whatever, uh, whatever he wants uh, to, in order to secure its uh, survival. So, and you know, arguing that the, that the sanction that uh, was the main uh, cause for the economic hardship in Syria is ridiculous. There are so many other uh, uh, factors and uh, explanation for this. As you, you mentioned corruption and uh, so many others. So I don't think that uh, on the one hand, uh, they are quite uh, effective, but on the other hand, they're not what uh, brought Syria to this grim economic situation. Uh, so we should definitely think uh, using other methods, other um, measures when dealing with this kind of uh, regime. Mm -hmm. the Thank, of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Morhaf. To the critics of uh, sanctions, to those who uh, think that sanctions are hurting the Syrian people, um, don't take my word for it. Uh, listen to Assad who said it publicly, that it is not the Caesar Act and sanctions uh, that have led mm -hmm. Syria to uh, where it is now, uh, and he's right. He's right. Uh, the Syrian economy is collapsing and has collapsed, not as a product of the sanctions, but again, a product of the accumulation of uh, uh, corruption and mismanagement and, and so on. Um, it is a tool of diplomacy, and uh, it, cost, it is cost-free for the governments who impose it, and it reminds uh, those uh, dictators who engage in the murder of their uh, citizens, uh, that there is accountability, there is punishment. And I cannot imagine that there would not be sanctions against a genocidal regime. And so I think sanctions should not only continue, they should be intensified. And as Ambassador Rabinovich said, uh, uh, reconstruction and the financing of reconstruction should be denied until such time uh, that the regime make uh, compromises. I agree uh, with Dr. Falenci that at the end of the day, survival trumps uh, uh, or mitigates, uh, or dictators rather uh, look to their survival more than anything else. I absolutely agree. Uh, but we have to use all the tools, including those diplomatic tools, in order to bring the crisis uh, uh, to a point where it is not done. Thank you very much, Morhaf. Itamar, the last word. Yeah. Uh, you know, sanctions have a limited value, but they have value, symbolic and actual. And it's part of a policy of pressure. And, and, uh, Morhaf Jewajati just mentioned. It's, uh, it goes uh, hand in hand with the denial of uh, financial aid for reconstruction as long as reforms are not, uh, are not introduced. And it's a long haul policy. It's not going to have immediate effects, but in the long run, it's the only option for a, a policy that doesn't want to use military means and has to rely on diplomatic means and economic sanctions. Well, 
that brings us to a close. So let me end by thanking all of you, Itamar, Karmit, Murhaf. You've given us enormous insight and a great deal to think about. I encourage all of you watching to look for the book, Syrian Requiem. It will be available very soon if it's not already out in the United States. And my thanks as well to our hosts at the Brookings Institution and the Israel Institute. Uh, my apologies to those of you who posed questions we weren't able to get to. I think you'll agree this has been a very substantive and interesting and productive exchange. Goodbye to you all and thank you. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.